Stephen Gilbo is a green Quebecois tornado. He's a journalist, a newspaper columnist who writes about science and the environment. He's an author, a consultant, a professional speaker, and advisor to venture capitalists. He's senior director of Equiter, which he co-founded in 1994. Equiter is probably the most influential environmental organization in Quebec, with 6,200 members and more than 40 employees. Its headquarters is in the new $30 million Maison du Développement Durable on downtown St. Catherine Street in Montreal. This amazing green building was created and is owned by the organizations that occupy it, including Amnesty International and the David Suzuki Foundation, as well as Equiter. And with all this activity already behind him, Gilbo is still not far north of 40. Oh, and he's also the father of four children. You've been a tree hugger since you were six. <laughs> yes. Tell me that I story. Have. I have. Yeah, a full-blown uh, tree hugger. Um, I come from a small town about uh, three and a half hours outside of Montreal, and basically in the middle of nowhere, a pulp and paper town. And uh, when I was a kid, we lived in, um, I mean, our house, just at the end of our yard was, was the forest, really. Uh, so this was, for many years, my playground. I was four or five. And one day they started cutting down that forest to make place for you know a new development. And I came into the house in a state of shock, and I told my mother, I said, Mom, they're, they're cutting down our forest. It was, you know, it was my playground. I said, what, what do we do? And she said, well, if you climb in a tree, uh, she said, she, you, they won't be able to cut down that tree. So I'm a little boy, a four or five year old. I spend my days playing in the forest. What do I do all the time? I climb in trees. So I found this tree and I climbed all the way to the top of it. And I stayed there. And the guys came and they started yelling at me, come down here. I said, no. They, someone knew who I was, so they went to get my mother. My mom came and she played along. She said, come down. And I said, no. And she said, she looked at these guys and she said, well, he doesn't want to come. Go and pick him up. And obviously, you know, I mean, no 200 pound man would, would be able to climb all the way up to come and pick me. There's, so I stayed there the entire day. So that day, that specific tree wasn't, wasn't cut down. Did it make a difference? Did they, did they leave any, any more trees than they might otherwise have No, done? no, I, I think, you know, the day after when I was at school or at daycare or something, they came and, and they cut it down. But, I, you know, I think I, I didn't realize it at the time. Obviously, I was too young, but I, I think this had a profound impact on my value system, how I, how, how I, I look at the world and and what, I, when I, what I've become today. Yeah, and, and knowing that a gesture like that can make a tremendous difference to uh, and and even rolling holes it off for a day, but still. Well, and for, you know, for her to empower me in such a, in such a way, for her to give me something, not, not leave me helpless, uh, faced with a situation I, it was very difficult for me to understand at the time, uh, I think was, uh, was very important. One of the things I did want to ask you about was the building. Very impressive, and you know where most NGOs seem to be housed in shabby little <laughs> quarters. This is a gorgeous building, and uh, obviously brand new, and many partners in it. You know, tell me a bit about how this came to be. About ten years ago, we we were in the not the nicest part of the not, not the nicest part of town. We were in a semi-industrial building, so it wasn't great. It was too way too hot in the summer. It was way too cold in the winter. Parts of the building were falling on, on us from time to time, ceiling, and so we said, okay, we need to move. And, and we, we started talking about it and, and thought of this great idea of, well, if we're moving, why not do something, why not make it significant from an environmental point of view, and why not try and put together this idea of, you know, do the greenest building we can, like pilot this project. Uh, so amongst first, at first Equiterre employees, and then we started uh, talking to other organization we work with on a, on a regular basis um, about this idea, and, and, and it really caught on, and people really liked it. So we started building the idea at first, and, and then we, we had a few partners and a few more, and then it became more of a serious project. Um, we, had, we had a lot of help from the Quebec government, the city of Montreal, to, to do that. Um, Ottawa, unfortunately, was a no-show. I mean, we, they wouldn't even return our phone calls when we, we wanted to talk to them about this. 
the the private sector uh, a number of companies in 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 quebec were tremendously helpful uh, rona the hardware store uh, was a big partner uh, very early on uh, hydro quebec the, the the utility uh the cascade uh, was uh, and a number of uh, of other countries but but at one point we said okay what are we doing is it going to be um is it going to be just a bunch of engo environmental organizations or do we want to make it a little bit broader and the name of the building is the the, the la maison du développement durable so the house of sustainable development so we wanted to add uh, other other aspect of, of of sustainable development to to what was a to what was an important contingent of, in, of environmental groups. So uh, the, as part of the founding member as well, uh, the French chapter of Amnesty in Canada is, is, is there. There's, a, there's an organization that's a consumer protection organization. There's a daycare. That's one of the founding members. We wanted, we wanted diversity, and, and I think we, um, it, it worked. It was a long project. Uh, it took about a decade, you know, between the time we started conceiving of the idea and, and the time we, we, we moved in. Uh, now it's a 50,000 square feet building right in the middle of downtown Montreal. Um, uh, we just got our LEED Platinum certification. It's the first commercial building in Quebec and one of a handful in, in, in Canada. And we're running the tests right now, but we suspect it's probably going to be one of the top 10 most efficient buildings in North America in terms of energy usage per, per square meter. So we, we're using all sorts of really neat technology such as geothermal, um, we're very, I mean, we, we've, we've invested a lot of, of energy and, and money and uh, resources on, on, uh, on the energy efficiency of, of, of the building, um, uh, a living wall of plant to filter the air inside the building, LED lighting, um, uh, a green roof obviously. Uh, on top we recuperate rainwater for, for, for the toilets. Uh, we're very proud. We're very happy. We've been here uh, just about two years, and it's uh, it's it's fantastic. And I mean, people often think, oh well, you know, doing the green thing or being environmentally conscious costs a lot of money. And it's true that the the building cost was more expensive than in, than if we built something just you know very average. Um, but we save four thousand dollars every month on our on our energy bill uh, over the over the lifetime of the building. Huge savings for, for 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 the organizations that that are here, and and a much smaller footprint, uh, environmental footprint as well. Yeah, you're walking the walk. You're not just talking the talk. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this was a way for us to, to try and showcase all these things we've we've been talking about for 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 so long, um, and and one of the things we were hoping to do, and I think we are starting to realize that it that it is happening, was to to show the um, the people in the building industry that they could do things differently architects contractors uh, engineering firms and there's a uh, there's a lot of interest I mean we organize visits of the of the buildings and uh, there's a lot a lot, a lot of interest by the by, by people in the, in the building industry to see how they could do things differently and what what basically is it they're going to build five or ten years down the road well we, we did it here did I see Alcan on the side of the building? Uh, Alcoa. Alcoa. Alcoa, the other big uh, yeah, aluminum yeah, company. Yeah, yeah, they were also yeah. a partner in the project. Mm -hmm. There's, um, boy, there's so many, so many uh, questions sort of spring out of just the story of the building. One that, uh, that occurs to me is the low Quebec is, has, by, from time to time, expressed aspirations to be a sovereign country. It certainly is a sovereign state of mind, right? It's a different place. Uh, and I'm struck by the public participation of the, uh, um, and the, the, the province and the, and the city. Um, it seems as though this is a much more cohesive place and that it's the kind of thing that you're doing, the green stuff that you're doing is much more in the mainstream than it is in other parts of North America. I mean, we do seem to be on the roll, and and I think it's you know for the last decade or so there's been a number of um, of either important environmental battles that were won, or um, or just significant movement that were made, not necessarily resulting from from a battle, but just um, perhaps a larger a larger awareness 
uh, here by the private sector, by the government, municipal or, or provincial, by the, by the public in, in, in general, um, it, it does seem to be a bit different. I, really hard to explain where is it coming from. I, I mean, I know, for example, that the lobbies, the, you know, the anti-climate lobbies, for example, and the skeptics are um, probably because of the language barrier far less present here than they are in English Canada or, or in the U.S., for example. I mean, we have, you know, we have a French version of Ezra Levant, but you know, very small um, audience doesn't get a lot of attention. Uh, the, 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 the climate deniers, I mean, you know, you, you see them, but they're very rare and few in numbers. And again, not a lot of people listen to them. So I, I think that, I mean, this, this certainly uh, is, is a big difference. Um, the public radio and, and TV have a much bigger share of, uh, of the audience here, like, like Radio Canada. Uh, you know, some of their shows, either TV or, or radio, are number one in the, in the province uh, and have huge audience. I mean, one of them has 1.52 million people. That's you know, that's a quarter of the population of the of the province, and and obviously you know, the public radio and TV tend to be much more favorable to. The, the messages about the environment to talking about it. They, they picked up on the issue of climate change um, in, a, in an articulated way much more sooner than, than more commercial or mainstream media did. I mean, if you look at Fox News, obviously they still haven't quite caught on to it yet. But uh, so uh, this is probably another, uh, another factor in, in, in those, those differences we see. Well, let me try a theory on I because it seems, it's always seemed to me that Quebec the people in Quebec understood their relatedness both to one another and perhaps to the environment, but certainly to one another, and that may be the result of having the unique linguistic situation. But that seems to feed into this kind of cooperation around a project like this and, and also uh, into an understanding of where you, where you are as a people in relation to things like climate. So. No, I think you're right. I think you're, uh, there's definitely some of it. We had actually, as part of the funding campaign for, for the building, we had a uh, a public, uh, cam public funding campaign, um, so people could donate money. We had um, a company that that built for us for free this wonderful media and public relations campaign. We had a bunch of commercial radio stations um, that said, "Okay, well, we'll air it for almost nothing." So there was a lot of there was a lot of enthusiasm by by the the community. And to, and to believing in, in this dream that we had of doing something cutting edge and, 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 and very, very inspiring. And, it, and it, I think it worked really well. Yeah, and sort of an, an okay, let's do it. Let's, yeah. let's see what we can do and exactly. see if it can't work. Uh, we, I did a, a piece at one point on an architect uh, builder in Nova Scotia who builds uh, passive houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, what she said, and I'm curious to know if this is a number that this um, building would reflect too, but she thought that it was between five and ten percent more to do this sensationally sealed envelope and, and so forth. Is that the kind of range we're talking about here? Well, for us it was more around fifteen, uh, but but because we added so many things that, like you know, collecting rainwater for 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 for, for the toilets, and there, there's a number of things that that we did um, that made a lot of sense from an environmental point of view, where there's there's less of a there's less of a payback uh, as opposed to just you know the energy savings where there's a clear economic um, benefit to it some of the things we did we we did because we felt beyond the the economics of it you, there was an environmental justification to to doing them so so it was it was 15% but over the life life lifetime of a building and, and the operating cost over 50 years of a 50,000 square feet building, 15% uh, in terms of uh, the construction budget is, it's, it's nothing. I mean, if you, if you take a bit of a, a wider perspective uh, at these things than just, you know, oh, how much is it going to cost me? Well, no, you can't just be thinking about how much your house is going to cost you and not think about the operating cost of your house for 25, 30 years. It's, and part of the reason we're in the trouble we're in is because we have thought only of cost and only of cost as measured in money, not in terms of damages and other kinds. 
let me come back to a place where I would have gotten to earlier had we not had <laughs> this unusual start. Uh, and that is, tell me a bit about Epithere, how it got started and what its, you know, what its activities have been, what its concerns have been. Equitar is, uh, is the dream of um, four or five um, university students who um, came out. So one of them was in, was in Rio in 1992. A lot of us were involved or, uh, in, in Rio uh, or pre-Rio or post-Rio activities. So not everybody, not, 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 not everybody went there in 1992, but, but it was a, a very defining moment for us as individuals. And some people, a few, a few were friends, but we, we, we met, um, most of us met at university and, and started working together and started doing projects together. And then had this crazy dreams of, this crazy dream of saying, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could, if we could work uh, in, in something for which we feel so passionate about, you know, environmental protection, more social justice, um, uh, fair trade, sustainable agriculture. Uh, in the beginning of the 90s, climate change was really, you know, starting to rise up as, a, as an issue. And very earlier on, we, we picked up on it and said, you know, God, we, we need to get involved. And, and we decided to create this organization, um, which was very, I mean, you know, out of nothing. I mean, we had nothing. We had no money, we, but, but we had a dream and we were young and very uh, determined um, so we, we got, you know, first little bit of funding from one per federal program to hire two person for, for, uh, for a summertime and, and then we got another grant and then some foundations pay, started paying attention to one foundation, Montreal McConnell, uh, started looking at what we were doing in terms of, uh, of agriculture. We had this, we started doing community supported agriculture. We started a pilot project and in Quebec and it worked really well uh, in 1995 we had one farm and about 25 partners and McConnell said oh we like that a lot and all uh, and they started giving us uh, some means to to make it broader and today um, as far as we know Ikitaya runs the largest community supported agriculture program in the world uh, we have about a hundred farms that are part of the of the program um, 11,000 families every year take part in it, so about 30,000 people uh, benefit from the program, and it's all been grassroots. I mean, the, 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 now the government is getting really interested in, in seeing how we could, uh, the, the provincial government, in seeing how we could adapt it to institutions. So instead of linking people with farmers, we would link hospitals and schools and even provincial prisons with local farms producing local and, and, and mostly organic vegetables, but instead of having all those intermediaries between the, the institutions and, and, and the producers cut uh, a, a lot of these people and, and link them together. And we've, we've started doing that as well, but it's been a, a hugely successful uh, project. And over the years, I mean, we, we, we've continued working on uh, fair trade has been one of our big project from the, from the get-go. Uh, Working with Oxfam in, in Quebec, we were able to implement uh, fair trade coffee at the National Assembly in, in, in Quebec City and, and a number of, uh, of different places. I mean, when we started, the only place you could really get fair trade coffee, we had to go to Ottawa at, uh, <laughs> at Bridgehead. The, the, their, first, uh, the, their first coffee shop was the only place around here where you could get that. And, uh, and now, I mean, you can find it basically everywhere. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a ride. It's been, and, Today, Kitaire is probably one of the 10, 12 uh, largest uh, environmental non-governmental organization in Canada. Uh, we have about 45 employees, uh, offices in Montreal and Quebec City, uh, hopefully in Ottawa soon, uh, s soon enough. So it's been, uh, it's been quite a ride. One of the largest organizations in Canada. Is it, is it perhaps the largest environmental organization in Quebec? Well, in terms of in terms of budget, employees, um, I I would yes, yes, uh, definitely, yeah. And it started with idealistic young people saying we would like to work in this field, and since there is no organization and no job for us, we will create them. So imagine me, and you know, with twenty years less than than what I have now, a bit of a beard, long hair. The, the archetype uh, hippie, um, which I, I wasn't in some respect because we were very 
organized and we were just, weren't just lying around and waiting for things to happen. We decided that we were going to make some things happen, but yeah, this just a dream and a, and a bunch of young idealistic. I feel very happy with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's. I mean, we're celebrating this year our 20th anniversary, and we've had a we've had a series of celebrations in, in, in different cities, and because we have um, uh, we have volunteer groups across the uh, across the province. Uh, so we're not just in Montreal and Quebec City. We're we're active in various regions. Not all of them, but five or six of them. In, in, in Quebec, so we so we had little celebrations and get together with with our volunteers and and I mean when you're when you're busy working on your day to day stuff and you know climate change and Kyoto Protocol and this and that it's not always obvious to to reflect back and and look at you know what's been happening and 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 we took the time to do that this year and looked at pictures and and it it's, it's very heartwarming to to see what what we've been able to do you have a kind of a philosophy about how how this kind of change well two things first maybe um, you have a very clear link with, with between environment and social justice very important tell yes. me about how, how those two are connected well for you. Uh, I mean for people who are less familiar with French equita basically means fair planet um, and uh, we're very uh, I mean, environmental issues, sustainable agriculture, climate change, sustainable transport are very, very important to us. But we we believe that we can't just think about environmental issues without thinking about a lot of the social aspect, that social inequities that that that, that are part of our uh, of our society. And and for us, these things go hand in hand. Um, and it, and it's always been there, and it it will continue. I don't think we would be who we are without that. That aspect of our, of our of our work and um, uh, of our value system. But for lots of people, they are separate. Right? They have, for lots of people, think, yeah, I can I can work on environmental issues, and social justice is somebody else's department. But for you seem to see them as being really interwoven, right? They are, and it's true. I mean, if you look at you know international negotiations on climate change for a long time. Um, I'm not sure it's because of nobody's fault, but the, the, the negotiations really, really focused on the environmental aspect of it and not a lot on the, on the, on the social and you know, climate justice aspect of it. And, and at one point, you know, everybody realized that, well, we can't, we can't continue doing that. We can't just talk about climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions without starting to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the South in terms of climate impact and how we need to help those people adapt to climate change. But also, you know, some of the things we're putting forward in terms of solutions, like carbon trading and, and these sort of things. And we're not necessarily opposed to carbon trading, but, but you can't do that and not pay a lot of attention to, to some of the re social ramification, and, and specifically in the South, not, not just in the South, but to, 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 that, that happened through, through, through these solutions. And now I think that in terms of the international negotiations on climate change, a lot more attention is being paid to the, the, the social aspect of, of it and, and realizing that you can't just deal with one without dealing with the other. Mm -hmm. And the problems are created in the North but felt in the South? That's well, thing, well yeah? obviously, yes. Yeah, this historic responsibility, this moral obligation we have, I mean, you know, people, uh, people in Africa and in South America didn't create this problem, we did. So we have an obligation to help them um, well, we have an obligation to, to, to show leadership in terms of tackling the issue, but also to, to, to help them deal with the problem we've largely created. I mean, we, it wasn't just us, but, but the majority of, of, of historical emissions is not, it's not the Chinese or even the Indians. It's us. And the solutions, it, it seems to me, sound as though they, they come hand in hand, too, if you, because you've got to make massive changes in behavior. And that's got to involve people more or less equally. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it's also why we wanted to do the the, the House of Sustainable Development. We, I mean, we wanted to incorporate other aspect of our society, not just environment. We, it's great to have kids here, you know, running around the building, and and it and it's great to have an organization like Amnesty International, which doesn't work on. I mean, sometimes work on environmental issue off uh, issues often doesn't, but. 
it's also it helps you know there's this cross pollinization effect uh, from us uh, on them and from them on on us make us make us more aware environmental groups of of of, of, of other aspect uh, of um, injustices in, in in the world and not just not just environmental but but social as well and human rights so i think it, it's a um, i mean basically it, it's more of a fair reflection of our society than just looking at things in silos yes that's right and those since the issues are connected and the organizations are all here together presumably you start to see cross-fertilization yes. new insights all that kind of thing well, you're working on this and we're working on this but actually yeah well, uh, climate refugee, for example. I mean, we, we've been doing some work with Amnesty because it's obviously an environmental issue, but it's, it's very much a human, uh, a human rights um, uh, issue as well. And then there's obvious linkages be between the two of them. So by, by partnering with, with an organization that's I mean, total, well, outside of, of our field and vice versa, we, we, we create much stronger um, much stronger messages and much stronger campaigns. The, the entire building is filled with that kind of NGO, I take it. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Because uh, one of the things that also struck me about something you said earlier is you're, uh, you're not hostile particularly to the, uh, uh, to the private sector. You obviously have found ways to work with them, even though in many respects you know, they're associated with the problems, right? Well, I mean, we believe that um, the problems that we're facing uh, have been created by our, by our collectivity and can only be, the solutions can only be collective. So, I mean, we can't, you know, people have a role to play as individuals, as consumers, as, as voters. Industries also have a role to play. Governments have a role to play. And, and we really believe in the value of trying to, to, to build bridges between sectors of our society to try and find solutions. And it's not always possible, and we don't always agree with them. I mean, Hydro-Quebec is a partner of, 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 of our project here. We've, we've, gone, we've gone up against Hydro-Quebec on, on some of the things they wanted to do. They wanted to build a, a natural gas plant 10 years ago. We thought it was a really bad idea, and we campaigned against it for, for months. We, Equitaire and other organizations, and eventually managed to convince the government that they shouldn't go ahead with it. We, we campaigned against nuclear power in Quebec, even though Hydro-Quebec for a long time was very favorable to it, until they decided to, you know, to, to shut it down. Until they became better informed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the fact that we have, that we, it's very rare that we'll refuse to talk to someone. I mean, it, it doesn't happen. Even if we have very big differences in terms of ideology or points of view, or we'll still, we'll still want to sit down and see, okay, well, is there, is there some way we, is there some way we can find to work together? Is there some things we agree on and, and we can try and, and move things along in this way? And, and perhaps one day we'll be able to move things on, 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 on other issues. So better to talk than, than, uh, than to fight all the time. Although I, part of this seems to me again to be these are doors that seem to open more easily in Quebec, and partly because you've got some really interesting companies in Quebec that are Quebec companies. I'm thinking like the Desmarais interests, for Cas example. Cascade. Right? Cascade, and, and, and then of course you have a, a very large third sector in the Cas Populaire movement, and, those, yes. and that's also something that's really, really, really central in Quebec, oh, yeah. not so central elsewhere. Very unique. You know? yes. Yeah, yeah. But then you look at something, uh, uh, something like Lac Megantic and the response of the railroad to that unbelievable tragedy, and it's hard to think that we've got much to say to that kind of person, right? Yeah, I mean the tragic accident that the public was response to the solidarity that expressed itself through this through this tragedy um, is. It's very reassuring um, that we that we can, and I mean we've seen it. You know, it's not that certainly is not specific to Quebec. We've seen it in terms of the Alberta floodings, for example, and another catastrophe where I mean it, it's it's good to see that we still have this sense of community and and, and in times of, of hardship to, that although we we have tended to become a bit more individualistic with, with time that we can still find ways find times to 
to remind ourselves that, that we are a collective and we're not just a, a bunch of individuals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I was thinking of the, of the really disappointing, uh, I can't believe that a Quebec-based company would have responded the way that the railway company did in Lac Megantic. Oh, I mean, that was so right. disgraceful, right? And, I, and I, I suspect that, that would, that's not in the genetics of Quebec business. Right? Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the company's response was just pathetic. And uh, one just hopes that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's an, an abnormal, abnormality in the private sector that, that, that a company would, would act in such a way. Unfortunately, we've seen perhaps too many examples many examples of where uh, a corporations or some corporations really don't don't want to take any of uh, any responsibility for 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 the mess they they create sometimes and that's that's unfortunate on the other side i mean we are seeing a lot of uh, more and more corporate responsibility in terms of environmental stewardship in terms of social issues there's still a long way to go but but there's there's things we can build on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to come back to your Hydro-Quebec example, um, having opposed them on some pretty major issues, nuclear is a big one, right? um, and then you come back and say, we'd like to work together with you on this other one, do they give you a, a little bit of a grilling before and say, you know, are you, aren't you the guy I saw? <laughs> right? It was really interesting. Um, I mean, we, we tend to think of these organizations or big corporations as monolithic blocks. They're not. There were people inside Hydro-Quebec who saw this as a great opportunity to see that they're not just, you know, this bad public utility that does nuclear power or that, you know, wants to dam every possible river that they, they can find, but that, they, that there's also a, a, an aspect of, of, of um, that they want to, to contribute to, 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 to solutions and to positive things. And there were people inside Hydro Quebec who we thought, oh my God, what are you doing even talking to these people? And throughout the realization of the building and then when we were trying to finalize the partnership with Hydro Quebec, there was some, um, I mean, it wasn't, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a slam dunk. <laughs> <laughs> was very high up in the food chain, there were some people who thought that, you know, this was, this was a very bad thing for Hydro Quebec. They shouldn't be doing it. More of an older mentality type of you know us versus them as opposed to other people were saying no i mean just like us we're saying you know we it's possible for us to disagree with some or many of the things we do but we can still find or if we work hard enough we can find ways to work together and i think in the end that that uh, that part of the the, the hydro quebec movement prevailed over the other you've been to greenland and and it had a powerful impact on you in terms of your view of climate change Absolutely. I mean, I, I had been working on climate change already for, for more than 10 years when I went to Greenland in, in 2005 as part of a, a Greenpeace expedition. Um, uh, but going there, going on the ice sheet, um, uh, there's a two group of scientists that accompanied the, the, the Greenpeace expedition. Um, so talking with some of these scientists, even helping them in, in some cases, getting um, ice core samples on, on, on the ice sheet and things like that. Seeing it with your own eyes um, just made me uh, so much more aware of the urgency. I, I mean, I think I, as a, as a climate activist, I was already worried, but, but, but it's like becoming a parent. And, you know, you're not a parent and you talk about future generations and, and I mean, I, I used to do that, and I believed in it, but all of a sudden you have kids, and then it takes a whole other meaning. And I think it was the same type of transformation for me. Going to Greenland uh, made it so much more concrete for, for, for me than, than it was before. What did you actually see? Well, um, I mean, one of the things that we saw was how fast some of the glaciers were receding four, five, ten times faster than their, their historical uh, movement. And, and seeing the, the look on the scientists' face who 
who went on the ice sheet and they were installing some of their equipment, uh, very precise GPS to, to measure the, the movement of the, of the glaciers. So they left on the helicopter and, and they got in the helicopter to where the glacier was supposed to be, to where uh, NASA photo satellite showed it to be a year bef before they, they were there. And then they got there and the glacier is not there. And they're in the helicopter and they oh my god we you know we probably just made a mistake in in programming the gps on board the helicopter we probably just have the wrong coordinates they have to keep going and keep going inland before they find the glacier and then they install their equipment they come back on the ship they compute everything and they realize that there was no mistake made with the with the the helicopter gps and and nasa hadn't made any mistake either in terms of providing them with with accurate pictures but the glacier had receded so much in just over over a year and then they started looking at, uh, at other data and other pictures and and other groups of scientists in Sweden and, and the US started looking at the same phenomenon and now we know I mean we, we're seeing what's 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 happening with the green line green line ice sheet and, and the melting last year which was happening not just on the edges of, of the continent but all all over the, the, the ice sheet um, I, I mean this was such a it was, it, was ter it was terrifying, really. To, it, it, it was terrifying to see it. It was terrifying to, to talk with people who've been studying glaciers their entire life, well, adult life, and who've been working on this for so long, and for them to realize what was happening, which was totally outside of you know, normal boundaries of what happens to, to glaciers, was, uh, uh, I mean, I, I guess, a wake-up call in, in a sense. So do you see you do you see fear in them? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And they're working on this professionally. Oh yeah. And now you're a father of four. Yes. Yourself. Um, and, and you connect the dots. How do we get other people to connect those dots that didn't get to see the glaciers? Um, it's something we struggle with every day here. How how to how to make more and more people aware uh, and there's the awareness aspect of it and I think you know it, it, it's starting to happen like we're we're seeing more and more Canadians even on the you know on the south side of the border people despite the money that's being invested by the the, the coal lobby and the oil lobby and the, the you know the Fox News and all and all that despite that people are starting to get it and and I think now for us the next big challenge is how to how to get people and and governments and and companies believe that we can make the change that needs to happen just like we needed to to do this building to show that we could do things differently that it's possible it's feasible it's not science fiction i think we need to we need to bring our our communities to you know it's it's partly individuals and it's it's also companies and and, and governments to to this point where they believe they can do it because right now there's you know I mean you talk to a CEO of a company and he'll tell you he believes in climate change but then he'll say oh well you know I can't I can't change fast enough or my company can't change fast enough or governments can't change fast enough and I think it's that that notion of um, uh, of inevitability that we have to change the and I think it's more of a, of a mental shift than it is uh, an issue of money or an issue of technology. You know, it has to happen here and, and here probably as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that makes eminently good sense to me. That, that, uh, uh, because when you look at, the, at what happens when there actually is, when you have to change in a big hurry, when there's, this is, in a sense, this is kind of remote and theoretical, but if you have a lack mechanic, things change fast. If you have a, a flooding in Calgary, things yeah. change fast. If somebody declares war, you transform the economy in three yeah. months, right? And, yeah. and it's, so it's clearly it's not, I mean, the, the, the problem is the intention, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about Stephen, and because you have, as I think I said when we first met, you seem to have as many careers going on simultaneously as two or three people would normally have in a lifetime. And, uh, and what, what's the direction in all of this? I mean, you, you're involved a bit with venture capitalism. You're still a writer. You're a journalist. You, you, you do a regular column. Um, you uh, obviously have the whole Equiter involvement, which is the core of, I guess, what you do. 
Um, what's where's the where do you see your fil- yourself going in the future? Where do you see your role? How do you see it changing and shifting? Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm a bit of a hyperactive uh, kind of person. Um, I mean, everything I do, I feel, is very linked. Like the work with the with the venture capitalists is just helping them better understand uh, sometimes environmental issues, sometimes environmental groups, sometimes uh, where the public is is at on on on, on these issues. Uh, it's great for me to learn about about uh, actually beyond learning about venture capitalism and how the the, the financial world works. It, it's been a bit of a revelation for me to to meet those investors and and and, and entrepreneurs who uh, who ha- you know they want to make money they but not at any cost like I've seen people who used to do to be in the coal business and, and one day said no I can't do that I, I can't continue doing that and they you know they, they became big wind developers uh, so you know money with a conscience I I guess you could you could call it and it it's been it's been tremendously inspiring for me to meet these people and, and, and to work in many cases with, 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 with some, some of them or, 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 or meet you know new generation of, of entrepreneurs who, who already have that environmental um, and, and often social aspect embedded in their DNA like LUFA for example and this wonderful idea of, of using our rooftops in our cities to grow food. Uh, and, and local food and, and, and no pesticides and, and make it available to the to the community and it, it, it's been it's been fantastic but I I think it comes back to this to this um, notion of uh, try to be a, as much as I can it's not always possible but to be a bridge builder between different portion of our of our of our society so doing a little bit of uh, media work as a columnist in newspaper for you know almost seven years now and, and for many other me I've been a commentator I've had other columns and but almost a decade now um, and and so the, the the media world and the private sector and and, and the nonprofit and uh, so I think uh, to yeah to build bridges between between sectors it's a whole network and mesh kind of yeah. environment that you're in right? yeah because our yeah, again, our society isn't environment and you know media and private sector. It's all, it's all interlinked. And I, I think I have either an ability or uh, just very determined in trying to. Maybe I'm not very good at it, but I just keep going at it until it happens. But at creating the, the, those links. Well, it sounds as though you see a, a, an opening here, an aperture, a, a way of something that you can move through and there's something good on the other side. I was thinking, for example, is that in your venture capitalist sort of advisor role, you're probably the guy who, when something like Lufa comes along, everybody says, well, that's crazy. You say, maybe it's not crazy. Maybe we should, you know, we can say no later, but we should maybe have a little look at it before we say no. And that's often, you know, they'll come to me for, for that type of, uh, of advice. Not It's not always what I do, but often it, it is. You know, what do you think about that? Um, sometimes it's... Uh, more contentious issues sometimes it's a really good idea and sometimes what do you think you know should we go there um, and I'll say well you know have you thought about this or this or that and and I'm an advisor so some, I, I don't make decisions but it seems that often they, they listen or well that's why they got you involved I right? guess, so. I guess so. <laughs> that was yeah. the idea was they'd have yeah. this source of of advice in house. You said something about the younger people, even in that field, which seems a long way from environment to, to a lot of us, um, having having this kind of consciousness in their DNA. Do you, do you find that generally with younger people that they you don't have to explain stuff like, you know, why you would build a building like this, for example, that they understand that almost uh, before you've started to talk about it? I think the new generations uh, is so much more aware and um, and ready to do things differently than than our generation and generations before us were. I mean, I learned about recycling when I was in my 20s. I come from a small town. I mean, it's, it's the, it didn't exist. And even when I came to Montreal, you know, we had to, I had to bike with paper and glass and metal in my big backpack because I had to take it to. There were only a few spots in the city where you could take your recycling. That, that was before the blue bins and the green bins. Um, I mean, now my kids and kids and 
in every school know about recycling, uh, you know, at the time they're six years old and even sometimes before that because they do it at home. Uh, they have programs in their schools, like environmental awareness program. There's a network in Quebec of a thousand schools. It's called the Bruntland Network, the, uh, the Bruntland Schools. And there's about a thousand of them. And I mean, they, they do all sorts of wonderful activity, greening of schoolyards, gardening, composting, recycling, energy efficiency. I mean, by the time these guys are 20, they'll, they'll know uh, as much, if not more, than, than, than I do now, uh, just because of, it, it will have been part of their, of, a, of their education and their, their evolution. That's the name for Gro Harlan Brunton of the Brunton Report? Yes, yeah? yes, yeah. yes. How did it come about? They've, She's Norwegian. She's not Quebec. No, no, right they, they just, they, they were inspired by the Brundtland, the Brundtland report, inspired by, by what she did. So they decided, it must be more than 15 years ago, to, to, to start with one school and to, and now, you know, if you want to be a Brundtland school, well, you have to, you have to, a certain number of things you have to do. So you can't just become a Brundtland school and do nothing. It's a commitment. It's, it's a responsibility that the, 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 the teachers and the, the, the direction of, of, of schools and, and the students and kids all take together. And uh, it, it's, one, it's wonderful. It's, it's just amazing. Sounds like it would be a fabulous educational oh, yeah. device. Eh? Oh, yeah. You, it is. You teach Very kids inspiring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and teaches them citizenship, responsibility, all kinds of... Exactly. And also it shows them... You know, initially we were talking about how important it had been for my mom to to give me something to do to empower me, and it, it shows the kid that there's so many things they can do that they're not powerless in front of some of the challenges that that we face. I mean, they're big challenges and they won't be easily resolved, but it shows them all the things they can do. And I think it's so important. I do too, uh, and I'm uh, but I didn't know about the Brundtland schools, and that's. I have Norwegian friends who are great admirers of Rhode okay. Island Brunflin. Well, I've, you can I've, tell them I've, that, yeah, yeah, there's, I can put you in touch with them. They're a wonderful group of people. Yeah, that's, that's quite wonderful, yeah. But, well, thank you. Yeah, that would, be a, that would it would be good to be in touch with them. See, I think one of the things that I, my ambitions for this conversation here is that we will open the door, you know, or, or shine a camera a bit into Quebec, which doesn't get an awful lot of attention from the English-speaking world, but I think it's always has this kind of thing going on it's always worthwhile to come here and ask questions about social progress <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah one thing that you have in quebec i think is the right to a healthy environment built into the legal system yeah how is that how has that worked is that well number one how did it come about and then number two now that it's there does it make a difference um it came about um when uh, thomas mulcair was a minister of the environment uh, in the province here and he came up with the idea of doing a, a bill on sustainable development. Um, to some extent, a little bit like what we've, what we've seen it federally in, in the early 90s with uh, Lucien Bouchard and Jean Charest as minister of the Envi federal minister of the environment. But he wanted to take it a step further. And to, to, I mean, he's a lawyer. So this, this legal um, approach to it uh, came a little bit from, for, from that. But he wanted to see how the government could, um, could commit itself uh, to doing better from a sustainability point of view. And, and not just adopt some broad policy, but actually have, you know, put it into in a regulatory framework um, and, and, and force ministries uh, to, to adopt sustainable development plans, to implement them, to evaluate them, to see what's working, not work, what, what's not working. And, and this idea of uh, right to a healthy environment came came from there, came from 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 that bill. Um, so the bill was presented in 2003, if I remember correctly, about about 10 years ago. To some extent, we haven't really seen the, the how how the, the the that part of the bill will will change things because it's we're still in the implementation phase, you know, by the time the bill was adopted and then ministries starting doing their, their, their sustainable development plan and then uh, started evaluating them. We're still in the, in the implementation phase. Um, so it's hard to tell at this point what, uh, what we've gotten out of it. But I mean, the message was, was, uh, was very clear. And, and, I, and I think in and of itself had a bit had a big impact like we're it's like um it's, it's a, a shift 
crazy? Yes, a, a, yes, but also a shift in, in, in mentality with decision makers, uh, with, uh, with, with, with our leaders that, uh, I mean, we need to start doing things differently. And it's not just, uh, it's not just wish, wishful thinking, but we're actually putting this into, into law. See, and what, the way it's been used elsewhere, and I'm curious if this is uh, contemplated or if it's uh, happening at all in Quebec, but the way it's been used in, in other countries where it's, it's part of it, is that citizens have been bringing suits and saying, okay, you can't put your nuclear waste down there, or you can't dam that river, or um, because that would offend my right to a healthy environment, and sometimes the right of the environment to be respected and revered on its own, you know? and and. It, 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 so it seems to put a lot of power back in the hands of ordinary people and citizens. And I was just curious if that's the way that you see it for unfolding here or if there have been any indications of sort of little sparks of that kind? I haven't seen any case so far, as, as far as I can remember, but I, I, I suspect you're right. I think that it is how it's going to evolve. I mean, we have companies that are more and more aware and more and more respectful. Unfortunately, we, we clearly have some that that aren't, and I think in, in those cases, more and more citizens will use these, these legal tools uh, to defend their rights, because it is a right here now. Yeah, yeah. And it's the kind of place that we're now, to come back to our earlier conversation about the building, it's the kind of place where Amnesty being concerned about human rights, yep. this is a human right. Yep. You, you now have a, an environmental human right, which really is the Venn diagram where you guys overlap. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You've also given some thought to politics, or been invited to give some thought to politics. Yes. <laughs> How do you see that unfolding? Um, I'm. I mean, my work is eminently political. Like I, there's rarely, a, maybe not a day, but certainly a week that goes by without me speaking to a politician at the municipal, provincial, or federal level. Um, uh, I think. I mean, I, I, we need good people in politics. We need people who, who have good, strong values uh, on the social side of things, on the environmental side of things. Um, uh, will I be one of, the, one of these people one day? Will I, will I go into the, the arena? Um, I, I'm very interested. Um, as you were saying earlier, I'm the father of four, uh, including two young girls who were four and six, and working with politicians um, gives me a, a taste of what it means in terms of the demand on, on, on your time and, and your family. And I think it's not a price I'm willing to pay right now to be away from my family so much, but um, you know, kids will grow and I'm still relatively young, pretty healthy, so I have a few good years hopefully ahead of me uh, but it's, I think it, it's something that I might want to do one day because I, I, I think it is very, very important. It's not the only way to contribute, though. I think that the work we do at Equitaire contributes tremendously to, to, to changes in our society. But, but obviously, you know, policy making uh, is also, uh, and regulations are also very important environmental drivers. And the things you do here, um, in a sense, it doesn't matter who's in office, if you're, if you're steadily pushing away in this direction, you'll have an effect on the politicians at second hand if they're paying any attention at all. Absolutely, and, and we, I mean, we've, you know, I've been asked by, by governments uh, from different political callers to, to do things for them, to sit on advisory committee, uh, to elaborate the climate change plan, to preside over a group of um, experts and, and bureaucrats to look at uh, how Quebec could do better in terms of uh, emerging renewable energy. Um, and I mean, we always say that our role is is nonpartisan, but it's highly political. I mean, we we do a lot of political work, but we just, as an organization, we don't have a political color. We don't, you know, we don't. We'll work with anybody who's willing to work with us. Well, this is part of your, in a sense, Catholic, and with a small c. <laughs> but you know, but but you're you're embracing your vision of how these things don't work, right? Yeah. And how you how you work together, so you don't go cutting them off. No. You know? Are there politicians, either present or past, that you particularly admire? Oh, there's there's a there's a lot of them. Um, I mean, uh, Jack Layton was a was a friend. I I started meeting Jack in the late '90s when we sat together on um, federal committees on climate change, and I 
we, we started, you know, we would meet every so often and, and we started going to international climate change conferences together. And so over, over the years, we, we became friends and I, I admired uh, Jack um, co quite a bit. Um, he was, um, yeah, yeah, tremendous Canadian. Um, and Bon Jacques, Jack, oh, I yeah. think is the... Bon, bon Jacques, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I've, I, I've been fascinating, fascinated by how um, over the years I've seen politicians come into the Ministry of the Environment who had really touched environmental issues and be transformed by their passage in, 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 in the Ministry. Um, Tom Mulcair uh, is, a, is, a, is another clear example. I've, I've worked with uh, a number of, um, um, I mean, Bernard Bigras in, in the Bloc Québécois, who uh, was their environment critic for 10 or 15 years. And in fact, when he left politics, I was at an event in Ottawa, and Elizabeth May was there, and she was, she was asked to say a few words. And one of the things she said, she saluted the work of her Bloc counterpart, like an uh, MP, a leaving MP, as someone who had, you know, despite being in another political party, but she, she felt the need to, to say bravo to someone who'd work really hard to keep bringing the issue at the, at the forefront. Um, I'm also good friends with Elizabeth. Um, we share many, many things, including uh, our birth date. We, yeah. we have <laughs> so, and I've known, uh, I've known Elizabeth for a long time, way before she was into politics, when she was at the Sierra Club, so working on climate change and, and, and other issues to, to, together. Her house in Ottawa at the time used to be a bit of a, a central point for, for, for environmentalists in Ottawa. There were a lot of meetings there and people, I mean, whenever I'd go to Ottawa, I would stay at her house because she had you know, a few spare bedrooms and it was a cheap way for us to, when Ikita was just starting and we couldn't really afford hotel rooms, <laughs> it, was a, it was a good way to be able to, to do our work at a, a low cost. It is one of the things that she's very strong about just at this moment. And but your story illustrates that it goes back. It's way part of the way she sees things. It's not just a strategic or tactical decision. Is the need for people of like minds to work together across party lines? Mm -hmm. That the, 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 the so much of the poison of what we see here seems to be the excessive partisanship. Oh yeah. yeah? It's, I, I was. I was in Ottawa not so long ago speaking with, a, with an MP um, who, who left politics since. And he was saying how um, ideas have no more currency here. It's all about partisanship. It's all about politics. And I, I salute uh, Elizabeth's effort into, for example, you know, creating the All Climate Caucus. So it's a caucus of MPs in Ottawa from all parties sit down and talk together and invite people to learn about climate change, to learn about uh, the science of climate change, to learn about impacts, but also to learn about solutions and policy and what's being done in Australia and Europe and what it is we, we could do here and to try, try to break this, this partisanship barrier and to, uh, for, and to try and ensure that ideas reclaim their, their, their place in, in, in the parliament. And I, I, I sure hope for all our sake that she's, that she's successful and that more and more people from all political parties uh, see the value in this. Stephen Gilbo is the kind of figure who seems to arise very naturally in Quebec, expressing Quebec's strong sense of community and collective identity, its broad concern for social and environmental justice, and the energy of its powerful cultural traditions. But after 10 years working for Greenpeace, Stephen Gilbo is also well-connected internationally, and his deepest concern is for global climate change. That's a preoccupation he shares with other Green Interview participants like James Hogan, George Monbiot, and James Lovelock, and with me. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Dawn Cameron.